something like that. But that's for the, it's one high school for the whole county. Yeah. Everybody knows each other. Probably, maybe a little too well, <laughs> <I'm> unfortunately. <sure. laughs> You're watching Shelf Life. My name is Arlen Hess, and my guest today is Natalie Seipolt, author of The Sound of Holding Your Breath. Uh, Natalie got her MFA in fiction from WVU. She lives and writes from Preston County, West Virginia. Her work has appeared in Glimmer Train, Appalachian Heritage, Still, The Journal, Switchback, RKVRY, Ardor Literary Magazine, among other journals. She's the winner of the Glimmer Train New Writers Contest, the Betty Gabehart Prize, the West Virginia Fiction Award, selected by Silas House, and the Still Fiction Contest. She's an active book reviewer, the literary editor for the Anthology of Appalachian Writers, on the selection committee for the Weatherford Award in fiction, and participates in Women of Appalachia. Am I getting it all? Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. <laughs> uh, she coordinates the high school workshop for the West Virginia Writers Workshop at West Virginia University in the summers, and currently works as an assistant professor at Pierpont Community and Technical College. Welcome to Pittsburgh. Great. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Oh, it's a, it's a great book. Thank you. My husband will vouch for that. I've been talking about it all okay. days. <laughs> and, okay. and I can't wait for him to read it. I can't wait to pass okay. it on. That's great. Even Can though we, it's hot pink. Right? <laughs> uh, well, I mean, it, it matches today. Did you do that on purpose? No. No. <laughs> and I actually had nothing to do with the pinkness of the cover. That was totally the um, design of Than Stifel, and you know, it was his vision. Really? So that you had no mm -hmm. input at all? Um, I did have some input. They asked me what I would like, what I thought, and you know, I gave them a bunch of um, ideas that were mostly like dark and you well, know the stories are dark. The stories are this pretty dark. This right? is what goes on underneath. Yeah, the yeah. Um, and then they came back with this, and I'm like, I would never would have thought about that, <laughs> but it's beautiful, and I love it. And let's please do that. Yeah. So it's. Um, I've often said that the House of Mirth is the most misleading title ever right. in literature. Right. <laughs> so this might be a misleading yeah. cover. Yeah. Well, his. Um, his image, his idea, yeah. the concept behind it um, is like the morning after some event has happened mm -hmm. that was terrible for you, but it's a bright, beautiful morning and mm. it's joyous for everybody else. But for you, it's, you know, this terrible thing has happened. Mm -hmm. to face and the sunlight. Yeah, and I, I loved that yeah, idea. Yeah, I can see that. Know? That's a great, and you know, it also has nice this, save there. Yeah, it kind of has this under image of like notebook paper. Mm -hmm. And, you know, a lot of my stories are about teachers mm -hmm. or students in school. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I thought it was really beautiful. Yeah. Um, a lot of these stories are in first person. Mm -hmm. um, tell, can you tell me about your process, writing in first person? Mm -hmm. um, well, for a long time, I guess I thought that third person was the, was the place to be, right? Um, especially in grad school, you know, I was kind of in that moment where third person is what everybody was expecting you to write in. Mm -hmm. um, but when I wrote in first person, when I got my first kind of first person story, it just felt more natural. It was voices that I understood. Um, I don't know that for me it's ever really an intentional process that I think, okay, this story will now be in first person or this story will now be in third person. I think I write and then see if it works, and if not, I go back and change it. So do you? Do you um, do, you do a lot of revision? I, I do. I do a lot of revision um, in my head, mm -hmm. I think. You know, I don't spend a lot of time like going back and forth on the page. Mostly it's, I think so much about the story for so long before I write it. And then I'll do, you know, some revision that way. But um, I think I probably don't do as much early revision as some people do because I have the story written in my brain for a long time before mm -hmm. I am able to sit down and put it to paper. People who mm -hmm. aren't writers don't fully understand that staring out the window can mm -hmm. actually be working. Right, <laughs> or driving, or, you know, I teach, so having time to focus on my own yeah. writing is always a mm -hmm. challenge. So tell me about your teaching. Mm -hmm. um, does that influence the way you write, since a lot of these are young people? Right. Um, well, so the high school writing workshop, you know, I just get to work with those kids for a couple of days in the summer. And luckily, um, they'll sometimes come back summer after summer. Mm. So I get to kind of follow them and watch them from before their freshman year until the summer mm. after their senior year. So that's been fun. And, you know, there's a couple of kids who've gone on to college, and I get to see them every once in a while. Um, but I don't get to spend a lot of time with them. My primary job is teaching at a community college in West Virginia, and most of my students are West Virginians. Um, I taught as a lecturer at WVU for a while, mm -hmm. for quite a while actually, before I took this job, and 
um, a lot of those students weren't from West Virginia. They, you know, were a very different kind of student. They were good. They were lovely. I liked working with them a lot. But at a community college, you have students who, you know, maybe never thought they would go to college mm -hmm. or who are first-generation college students, and they don't understand necessarily the college talk that we all take mm -hmm. for granted. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, or they're, you know, learning to study things like... Um, petroleum engineering because they want to work in the gas fields. So it's a very different kind of work. Um, but when I started teaching there, you know, I felt more like I had found my people mm -hmm. because that's kind of how I, you know, I grew up mm -hmm. very working class, um, rural, mm -hmm. didn't have a lot of money. And, you know, so I, I feel like we understand each other and they know that I'm not a phony and I know that they're not right. phonies. They're and, right. Yeah. And, you know, there's something comfortable yeah. about that. Yeah. Um, I think just being around them, being around the people that I want to write about and that I'm from as well, helps my writing in that way. Are you um, teaching composition, creative writing, um, literature? I probably, well, we, we unfortunately don't really have creative writing classes say, yeah, at, this, probably at, didn't. at this school. It's a community and technical college, mm -hmm. so there's a lot of technical programs. Um, I teach primarily composition mm -hmm. and technical writing, mm -hmm. um, and I teach a little bit of literature. Um, and we're trying to bring in, I'm making it my personal goal in life, to bring in more Appalachian literature to their classrooms. Because, right. um, you know, we're in the heart of Appalachia. West Virginia is the only state that is completely Entire. within mm -hmm. Appalachia. So the fact that they're still, you know, using very traditional textbooks mm -hmm. that focus on the, you know, the classics, mm -hmm. which are great, like Reed Faulkner and Hemingway, mm -hmm. but also like to show them that there are stories about people about like them, them by people like them. I yeah. think that's really important. So your high school writers are focused on creative writing. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. And your college writers are focused on composition. Right. So well, they're focused on whatever they need to do to get, right. get a right. degree. But, but, right. Right. Yes, right. yes right. in my classes, yeah. They're mm -hmm. focused on freshman composition, essay writing. How do you motivate the high school students? Well, I mean, they're there by they, choice. Right. They're right. there by choice, so they need little motivation. Right. I'm just kind of there to guide them and yeah you know, they're excited to be there. They they really like coming and, you know, finding their tribe mm -hmm. in kind of a different way, you know, than what I was talking about finding mine. But, mm -hmm. you know, they're in high schools where probably students aren't doing a lot of reading no, or right. writing. Exactly, right. So they're coming from all over and they're mm -hmm. finding this small group yeah, that's like so them. Yeah, they find kids who are like them. And mm -hmm. um, so in that way, I think that the high school workshop is as much about yeah. them just coming and getting to socialize with like-minded mm -hmm. people. Um, and they don't they don't need a lot of motivation. Mm -hmm. College students <laughs> usually need a little bit more. Right, no, I'm sure that they do, considering yeah. the kind of student and the kind of degree they're right. looking for. So you are really in control of the writers you introduce to both the high school students and the college students. I try to be. Yeah. I try to be. Um, Who are you introducing them to? Um, well, both groups. Sure. So, you know, we have textbooks mm -hmm. in our college classes, of course. We all use a the same textbook Stand, okay. right so I try to bring in things um, that will be more relevant to them like more regional things mm -hmm. um, we don't we can't read a lot of fiction in that class obviously mm -hmm. because it's a composition class um, I did bring them an essay by um, Jonathan Hall who uh, actually wrote for wrote the essay for the um, Anthony Bourdain feature when he came to West Virginia mm -hmm. and his article was called hunting while black um, and he wrote about sort of the complications of moving to Morgantown um, as a black man and wanting to hunt and then having all of these things that were, you know, connected with that. Um, you know, just the idea of being seen in the woods with a gun, with a gun. was scary mm -hmm. to him in ways that it wouldn't be scary for my students, for right. example. Right. Um, so that was really interesting and seeing their reactions to that was pretty, um, it was kind of illuminating for me, I think, you know, that I wasn't aware of some of the things that mm -hmm. um, both the essay talked about and also the way that my students responded well, to it was interesting to me. Um, I've brought them some Ann Pancake essays. Great. Um, I often have them read Tough, um, which is an essay that she published several years ago about growing up mm -hmm. kind of poor in rural Appalachia. Um, yeah, so uh, the high school writers, I try to bring them some Robert Geip. Mm -hmm. Um, who, if you're not familiar with Robert Geip, he wrote this amazing book called Trampoline. Mm -hmm. And um, it's an illustrated novel. Oh, wow. So it's not a graphic novel in that the stories don't tell the, or the pictures don't tell the story. But it's an illustrated novel in that the stories are, the pictures are part of the story. 
It's a so, G-I-P. G-I-P-E. Okay. Uh-huh. And it's, it's going to be a trilogy. So the first book is called Trampoline, and the second is Weed Eater. Wow. And then there'll be a third that's not out yet. Um, and I like to bring that to the high schoolers because it's a different form, mm -hmm. and they can see how words and images can work sort together. of work together. And also, it's a very strong female first-person voice from a 14-year-old girl living in Kentucky. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, we get to talk about things like voice and dialect and, mm. you know, all of that. Um, what Appalachian writers have influenced you? So, a lot. Yeah. You know? um, and Pancake certainly was one of my earlier influences. I went through high school, you know, like most high schoolers, I think, not really knowing or thinking that people from West Virginia could be writers. Mm -hmm. So when I went to college and discovered that Ann Pancake was from Romney, mm -hmm. uh, Romney, West Virginia, that was a big moment for me, right, that I realized mm -hmm. not only could you come from West Virginia and be a writer, but you could be successful. Mm -hmm. um, Jane Ann Phillips mm -hmm. from Buchanan, sure. certainly. Um, Silas House has been a great influence. Uh, Eudora Welty, more classic, um, and some would consider her Southern, but she did spend some of her life in Southern West Virginia. Uh, I love Eudora Welty and Flannery O'Connor. Yeah. Of course, we would consider her Southern writer as well. But, but you're bringing up an excellent point, which mm -hmm. we will end up talking about at another time. Right. But Appalachian literature is mm -hmm. cl very closely connected to Southern literature right. and becoming its own subgenre. Right. If I'm reading that right. Well, and I think that it's. You know, the borders are very blurred. Mm -hmm. You know, we would talk about, I learned about Lee Smith as a Southern writer. Most oh, wow. people that I know now refer to Lee Smith as an Appalachian writer. Yeah. So, so Silas House just won a big award for Southern writers, but he lives in Kentucky. So, you know, it's all very blurred, and I'm not sure it matters. You know, like, do we need to have that label? Yeah, I no, know. I don't know. But, but it seems like sometimes, from as an outsider, mm -hmm and from what I'm learning and reading about Appalachian writers, mm -hmm. um, that a lot of times the decisions about Appalachian writers are mm -hmm. being made by people from, or Appalachia in general, right. those decisions are being made by people who are not native. Absolutely, yeah. 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 yeah, really interesting. Mm -hmm. um, so what are you working on now? So um, I'm working on a collection of linked stories mm -hmm. that are primarily done um, actually, the last story in this collection, which is called Hunting the, Stalking the White Deer, mm -hmm. Hunting the White Deer, is kind of a prequel mm -hmm. to the stories in my next collection. They're um, about that same family, that same town. So I've been working on that for several years, and um, that's about done. Every time I feel like I'm done, I think, but no, I just need one more story <laughs> to go in there. Uh, and I've already also started a novel. I was that, gonna ask, yeah. yeah, I've started a novel that I'm I'm not quite ready to talk about what that theme is yet because I'm not sure I know exactly. Do you but, feel driven to write a novel? Um, because you have mastered the craft of short stories. Thank you. Um, I think that I've always because I've loved to read novels so mm. much. I think that I've always felt like I was going to be a novel writer, mm. um, but then short stories sort of just is where I found my heart. When I, I was think in it's school. the perfect form. I really do. Thank I love. Well, short I love short stories too, and more and more, I think that, you know, when people have less time, mm -hmm. less time to read and less time to write, that's a form that's more, you know, palatable. Like you can read it on the bus, or you can read it in the airport. Right, right, you know, right. it's a little, it's quicker. Mm -hmm. um, but I also feel like some stories need a novel, right? You just mm -hmm. need to right. Some to stories have more, are longer, time right? Yeah, yeah. And I think even. Even these stories, which are not connected stories, are connected stories, mm -hmm. right? They're all sort mm -hmm. of connected by region and mm -hmm. sometimes by people and place. So that's just sort of how my mind works, mm -hmm. that everything is always connected anyway. Yeah. I mean, I don't so. feel like some of them are necessarily Appalachian stories. Mm -hmm. They're just universal great stories. Right. And I think that's what all good Appalachian mm -hmm. literature should do, yes. right? <laughs> exactly. We, we all should have universal hearts. Right. Why right? do we other the Appalachian? Right. We don't that's say that a book set in New York is a New York City book, right? right. We say right. it's a book, and everybody is expected to read it. Yeah. So, yeah. Will you read uh, a bit for us? Oh, sure. you're going to read? Great, okay. Yeah, so I'm going to read just the first um, like page and a half from, or maybe two, two and a half pages, mm -hmm. from the title story of my collection. Uh, so this is the beginning of The Sound of Holding Your Breath. 
When Clint comes inside, I don't ask him where he's been. It's raining hard. A giant puddle has formed in our yard and some scrawny ducks have found it. I'm watching them out the kitchen window as they glide around and dip their heads down into the big mud hole when I hear the screen door thwack shut behind me. Hello, honey, I say. I hope that he'll come up behind me and put his arms around my waist and hug me close to him. The kitchen feels thick and heavy. I finger the tiny crucifix at my throat and say, still raining? It is. I think it will never stop this time, I say, and a duck pops out of the puddle and ruffles his feathers. He shakes like a wet dog. Better build an ark. Clint takes his wet boots off by the door like the good boy he is. I glance at him over my shoulder and see that he is shaking his head too, like a duck, like a dog, and little drops of water are flying around the kitchen. His hair is getting long. You should let me cut that mop of yours tonight. It's starting to look pretty shaggy, I say. Then I know he will not let me cut his hair. He is on pause, waiting. At first, I couldn't even get him to eat or drink anything. He wouldn't shower or change his clothes. He just walked out of the back porch door and waited. I finally convinced him that he had to act more normal, and if the police came down our drive, he had to be like his old self or we'd be done for. I saw the lights early this morning while he was still asleep, our closest neighbor. It is too far away to see the cars, but in the dark early morning, I see the red and the blue flashing up above the treetops. I waited an hour until the sun was higher and driving by on my way to town wouldn't look so suspicious. I left Clint a note. Went into the market, don't go out there today. I drove slow past Rob's place. It was like always, the house lopsided as if the right side was sinking into the ground. The white paint chipping off the porch, the old red truck and the nice little blue car parked out in front. There were two police cars in the driveway, one of the old white Broncos that Sanders or Pete drove and one of the newer, shinier blue cruisers from the Sheriff's Department. They were inside, so there was no way to tell the level of concern who was taking what seriously. I imagined them sitting around the kitchen table, cups of weak coffee getting cold as Rob's wife Tiffany wiped mascara across her cheeks. His truck was in the driveway, but she hadn't seen him in about three days. I imagined Tiffany pounding the table with her tiny fists, crying harder as Pete or Sanders patted her shoulder, and the deputy, whichever one had been unlucky enough to be sent all the way out to our skinny dirt roads, squirmed uncomfortably. Tiffany didn't understand. She never could because she came here already grown. You have to be here from the start, born out into the dirt and the, ro and the, dirt and the woods and the mountains and the close inside feeling like me, like Clint, like Rob, to really know. Some days I feel off my axis, wobbly or spinning, but today I feel sharp and clear. Mm. Thank you. Thank you for reading. What I love so much about your work is that you don't say everything. I mean, you, t you, you show us, you tell us a story, but there are always details that are left out. You really trust your reader. Thank you. Yeah. I try to. Yeah, you do. Yeah. How can people contact you if they want to engage with you about your mm -hmm. work? So my website is my name, so nataliesipolt.com. S-Y-P-O-L-T. Yes, okay. S-Y-P-O-L-T. Um, you can find me on Facebook at Natalie Seipolt Writer. And um, Twitter and Instagram are both just my name, Natalie at Natalie Seipolt. At Natalie Seipolt. Mm -hmm. Great. Yes. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. I look forward to having a longer conversation about mm -hmm. Appalachian literature another time. Right. Thank you so much for inviting me. Yeah, it's my pleasure. Mm -hmm. You've been watching Shelf Life, a joint production of PCTV21.org and City Books located at 908 Galveston Avenue on Pittsburgh's north side. You can follow our website, which is www.citybookspgh.com or all of our social media channels at citybookspgh. Thanks for watching. Okay, Carl. <laughs>